J.R.R. Tolkien's The Hobbit, as read by Jonathan Castle, Cavern Keep of the Black Dragon Tavern, Chapter 1, An Unexpected Party. In a hole in the ground there lived a hobbit, not a nasty, dirty, wet hole filled with the ends of worms and an oozy smell, nor yet a dry, bare, sandy hole with nothing in it to sit down on or to eat. It was a hobbit hole and that means comfort. It had a perfectly round door like a porthole, painted green with a shiny yellow brass knob in the exact middle. The door opened onto a tube-shaped hall like a tunnel, a very comfortable tunnel without smoke, with panelled walls and the floors were tiled and carpeted, provided with polished chairs and lots and lots of pegs for hats and coats. You see, the hobbit was very fond of visitors. The tunnel wound on and on, going fairly but not quite straight into the side of the hill. The hill, as all the people for miles around called it. And many round doors opened out of it, first on one side, then on the other. No going upstairs for hobbits. Bedrooms, bathrooms, cellars, pantries, lots of these. Wardrobes, you see he had whole rooms devoted to his clothes. Kitchens, dining rooms. All were on the same floor, and indeed on the same passage. The best rooms were all on the left-hand side of the house, going in, of course, for these were the only ones to have windows, deep-set round windows looking over his garden and the meadows beyond, sloping down to the river. This hobbit was a very well-to-do hobbit, and his name was Baggins. The Bagginses had lived in the neighbourhood of the hill for time out of mind and people considered them to be very respectable. Not only because most of them were rich, but also because they never had any adventures, or did anything unexpected. You could tell what a Baggins would say on any question without bothering to ask him. This is a story of how a Baggins had an adventure, and found himself doing and saying things altogether unexpected. He may have lost the neighbor's respect, but he gained. Well, you will see whether he gained anything in the end. The mother of our particular hobbit. What's this? What is a hobbit? I suppose hobbits need some description nowadays, since they have become quite rare and shy of the big people, as they call us. They are, or were, a little people, about half our height, and smaller than the bearded dwarves. Hobbits, you see, have no beards. There is little to no magic about them, except the ordinary everyday sort, which helps them to disappear quietly and quickly when large stupid folk like you and me come blundering along, making a noise like elephants which they can hear a mile off. They are inclined to be fat in the stomach. They dress in bright colours, chiefly green and yellow, wear no shoes because their feet grow natural leathery soles and thick warm brown hair like the stuff on their heads, which is always curly. They have long, clever brown fingers, good-natured faces, and a laugh that is deep and fruity, especially after dinner, which they have twice a day when they can get it. Now you know enough to go on with. As I was saying, the mother of this hobbit, of Bilbo Baggins, that is, was the famous Belladonna Took, one of the three remarkable daughters of the old Took, head of the hobbits who lived across the water, the small river that ran at the foot of the hill. It was often said in other families that long ago one of the Took ancestors must have taken a fairy wife. That was, of course, absurd, but certainly there was still something not entirely hobbit-like about them. Once in a while, members of the Took clan would go and have adventures. They discreetly disappeared and the family hushed it up. But the fact remained that the Tooks were not as respectable as the Bagginses, though they were undoubtedly richer. Not that Belladonna took herself ever had any adventures after she became Mrs. Bongo Baggins. Bongo, that was Bilbo's father, built the most luxurious hobbit hole for her, and partly with her money, that was to be found either under the hill or over the hill or across the water. And there they remained to the end of their days. Still, it is probable that Bilbo, her only son, although he looked and behaved exactly like a second edition of his solid and comfortable father, got something a bit queer in his makeup from the Took side, something that only waited for a chance to come out. 
The chance never arrived, until Bilbo Baggins was all grown up. Being of about fifty years old or so, and living in the beautiful hobbit hole built by his father, which I have just described for you, until he had, in fact, apparently settled down immovably. By some curious chance, one morning long ago in the quiet of the world, when there was less noise and more green, and the hobbits were still numerous and prosperous, and Bilbo Baggins was standing at his door after breakfast, smoking an enormous, long, wooden pipe that reached down nearly to his woolly toes, neatly brushed, of course. Gandalf came by. Gandalf, if you had heard only a quarter of what I have heard about him, and I have only heard very little of all there is to hear, you would be prepared for any sort of remarkable tale. Tales and adventures sprouted up all over the place, wherever he went, in the most extraordinary of fashions. He had not been down that way under the hill for ages and ages, not since his friend the old Took died, in fact, and the hobbits had almost forgotten what he looked like. He had been away over the hill and across the water on businesses of his own since they were small hobbit boys and hobbit girls. All that the unsuspecting Bilbo saw that morning was an old man, with his staff. He had a tall, pointed blue hat, a long grey cloak, a silver scarf over which his long white beard hung down below his waist, and immense black boots. Good morning, said Bilbo, and he meant it. The sun was shining and the grass was very green. But Gandalf looked at him from under his long, bushy eyebrows that stuck out further than the brim of his shady hat. What do you mean? he said. Do you mean to wish me good morning? Or mean that it is a good morning whether I want it or not? Or that you feel good this morning? Or that it is a morning to be good on? All of them at once, said Bilbo. And a very fine morning for a pipe of tobacco outdoors, into the bargain. If you have a pipe about you, sit down and have a fill of mine. There's no hurry. We have all the day before us. And then Bilbo sat down on a seat by his door, crossed his legs and blew out a beautiful grey ring of smoke that sailed up into the air without breaking and floated away over the hill. Very pretty, said Gandalf. But I have no time to blow smoke rings this morning. I am looking for someone to share in an adventure that I am arranging, and it is very difficult to find anyone. I should think so in these parts. We are plain, quiet folk and have no use for adventures. Nasty, disturbing, uncomfortable things make you late for dinner. I can't think what anybody sees in them, said our Mr. Baggins, and he stuck one thumb behind his braces and blew out another, even bigger smoke ring. Then he took out his morning letters and began to read, pretending to take no more notice of the old man. He had decided that he was not quite his sort, and he wanted him to go away. But the old man did not move. He stood leaning on his stick and gazing at the hobbit without saying anything, till Bilbo got quite uncomfortable and even a little cross. Good morning, he said at last. We don't want any adventures here, thank you. You might try over the hill or across the water. By this he meant that the conversation was at an end. What a lot of things you do use good morning for, said Gandalf. Now you mean that you want to be rid of me and that it won't be a good morning until I've moved off. Not at all, not at all, my dear sir. Let me see. I don't think I know your name. Yes, yes, my dear sir. And I do know your name, Mr. Bilbo Baggins. And you do know my name, though you don't remember that I belong to it. I am Gandalf, and Gandalf means me. To think that I should have lived long enough to be good morning by Belladonna Took's son, as if I was selling buttons at the door. Gandalf, Gandalf! Gracious me! Not the wandering wizard that gave old Took a pair of magic diamond studs that fastened themselves and never came undone till ordered? Not the fellow who used to tell such wonderful tales at parties about dragons and goblins and giants and the rescue of princesses and the unexpected luck of widow's sons? Not the man who used to make such particularly excellent fireworks? I remember those. Old Took used to have them on Midsummer's Eve. Splendid! 
They used to go up like great lilies and snapdragons and labanums of fire and hang in the twilight all the evening. You will notice already that Mr. Baggins is not quite so prosy as he liked to believe. Also, that he was very fond of flowers. Dear me, he went on. Not the Gandalf who was responsible for so many quiet lads and lasses going off into the blue for mad adventures. Anything from climbing trees to visiting elves or sailing in ships, sailing to other shores. Bless me, life used to be quite int- I mean, you used to upset things quite badly in these parts once upon a time. I beg your pardon, but I have had no idea you were still in business. Where else would I be? said the wizard. All the same, I am pleased to find you remember something about me. You seem to remember my fireworks kindly at any rate, and that is not without hope. Indeed, for your grandfather's sake, and for your poor mother, Belladonna, I will give you what you have asked for. I beg your pardon? I haven't asked for anything. Yes, you have. Twice now. My pardon. I give it to you. In fact, I will go so far as to send you on this adventure. Very amusing for me, very good for you, and profitable too, very likely, if you ever get over it. Sorry, uh, I, d I don't want any adventures, thank you. Not today, good morning, but please come by for tea, any time you like. Why not tomorrow? Come tomorrow. Goodbye. And the hobbit turned and scuttled inside his round green door, and shut it as quickly as he dared, not to seem rude. Wizards, after all, are wizards, and you dare not insult a wizard, even on your own doorstep. What on earth did I ask him for tea for? He said to himself, as he went to the pantry. He had only just had breakfast, but he thought a cake or two and a drink of something would do him good after his fright. Gandalf, in the meantime, was still standing outside the door and laughing long but quietly. After a while, he stepped up and with a spike on his staff, scratched a queer sign into the hobbit's beautiful green front door. Then he strode away, just about the time when Bilbo was finishing his second cake, and beginning to think that he had escaped adventures very well. The next day he had almost forgotten about Gandalf. He did not remember things very well unless he put them into his engagement tablet, like this. Gandalf, tea, Wednesday. Yesterday he had been too flustered to do anything of the kind. Just before tea time there came a tremendous ring on the front doorbell. And then he remembered. He rushed to put on the kettle and put out another cup and saucer and an extra cake or two and then ran to the door. I'm so sorry to keep you waiting, he was going to say. When he saw it was not Gandalf at all, it was a dwarf with a blue beard tucked into a golden belt and very bright eyes under his dark green hood. As soon as the door was opened, he pushed inside, just as if he had been expected. He hung up his hooded cloak on the nearest peg, and, Dwallin, at your service, he said with a low bow. Bilbo Baggins at yours, said Bilbo, too surprised to ask any questions for the moment. When the silence that followed had become uncomfortable, he added, and I was just about to take tea, pray come and have some with me. A little stiff, perhaps, but he meant it kindly. And what would you do if an uninvited dwarf came and hung up his things in your hall without a word of explanation? They had not been at the table long, in fact, they had hardly reached the third cake, when there came another even louder ring at the bell. Excuse me, said the hobbit as he ran off to the door. So you've got here at last. That was what he was going to say to Gandalf this time. But it was not Gandalf. Instead, there was a very old-looking dwarf on the step with a white beard and a scarlet hood. And he too hopped inside as soon as the door was open, just as if he had been invited. I see they've already begun to arrive, he said as he caught sight of Dwalin's green hood hanging up. He hung his red one next to it and said, Bolin, at your service, with his hand on his breast. Thank you, said Bilbo with a gasp. It was not the correct thing to say, but they have begun to arrive, had flustered him so badly. He liked visitors, but he liked to know them before they arrived, and he preferred to ask them himself. 
He had a horrible thought that the cakes might run short, and then he, as the host, he knew his duty, and he stuck it out however painful. He might have to go without. Come along in and have some tea, he managed to say after taking a deep breath. A little beer would suit me better, and if it's all the same to you, my good sir, said Bolin with his white beard. But I don't mind some cake, seed cake if you have it. Lots? Bilbo found himself answering to his own surprise, and he found himself scuttling off, too, to the cellar to fill a pint beer mug, and then to a pantry to fetch two beautiful round seed cakes he had baked that afternoon for his after-supper morsel. When he got back, Bolin and Dwalin were talking at the table like old friends. As a matter of fact, they were brothers. Bilbo plumped down the beard and the cake in front of them, when a loud ring came at the bell again, and then another ring. Gandalf for certain this time, he thought as he puffed along the passageway. But it was not. It was two more dwarves, both with blue hoods, silver belts, and yellow beards, and each of them carried a bag of tools and a spade. In they hopped as soon as the door began to open. Bilbo was hardly surprised at all. What can I do for you, my dwarves? he said. Keely, at your service, said one. And Feely, added the other and they both swept off their blue hoods and bowed. "'And yours and your families," replied Bilbo, remembering his manners this time. "'Dwolin and Bolin are here already, I see,' said Keeley. "'Let us join the throng.' "'Throng?' thought Mr. Buggins. "'I don't like the sound of that. I really must sit down for a minute and collect my wits, and have a drink.' He had only just had a sip, in the corner, while the four dwarves sat around the table and talked about mines and gold and trouble with goblins and the trepidations of dragons and lots of other things he did not understand and did not want to. For they sounded much too adventurous when his bell rang again as if some naughty little hobbit boy was trying to pull the handle right off. Someone's at the door, he said, blinking. Some four, I should say, by the sound, said Feely. Besides, we saw him coming along behind us in the distance. The poor hobbit sat down in the hall and put his head in his hands, and wondered what had happened, and what was going to happen, and whether they would all stay for supper. Then the bell rang again, louder than ever, and he ran to the door. It was not four, after all, it was five. Another dwarf had come along while he was wandering in the hall. He had hardly turned the knob before they were all inside, bowing and saying, At your service! One after another. Dori, Nori, Ori, Oin, and Gloin were their names, and very soon two purple hoods, a grey hood, a brown hood, and a white hood were hanging on the pegs, and off they marched with their broad hands stuck into their gold and silver belts to join the others. Already it had become almost a throng. Some called for ale, and some for porter, and one for coffee, and all of them for cakes, so the hobbit was kept very busy for a while. A big jug of coffee had just been set in the hearth, and the seed cakes were gone, and the dwarves were starting on a round of buttered scones, when there came a loud knock. Not a ring, but a hard on the hobbit's beautiful green door. Somebody was banging with a stick. Bilbo rushed along the passage, very angry and altogether bewildered and bewathered. This was the most awkward Wednesday he ever remembered. He pulled open the door with a jerk, and they all fell in, one on top of the other. More dwarves. Four more. And there was Gandalf behind, leaning on his staff and laughing. He had made quite the dent in the beautiful door. He had also, by the way, knocked out the secret mark that he had put there the morning before. Carefully, carefully, he said. It's not like you, Bilbo, to keep friends waiting on the doormat and then open the door like a popgun. Let me introduce Beefer, Bofer, Bomber, and especially Thorin. At your service, said Beefer, Bofer, and Bomber, standing in a row. Then they hung up two yellow hoods and a pale green one. 
and also a sky-blue one with long silver tassels. That last one belonged to Thorin, an enormously important dwarf, in fact, no other than the great Thorin Oakenshield himself, who was not at all pleased at falling flat on Bilbo's mat with Beefer, Bofer, and Bomber on top of him. For one thing, Bomber was immensely fat and heavy. Thorin, indeed, was very haughty and said nothing about service. But poor Mr. Baggins said he was sorry so many times that at last he grunted, Pray don't mention it! and stopped frowning. Now we are all here, said Gandalf, looking at the row of thirteen hoods, the best detachable party hoods, and his own hat hanging on the pegs. Quite a merry gathering. I hope there's something left for the late comers to eat and drink. What's that? Tea? No, thank you. A little red wine for me, I think. And for me, said Dorin. And raspberry jam and apple tart, said Beefer. And mince pies and cheese, said Beaufort. And pork pie and salad, said Bomber. And more cakes and ale and coffee, if you don't mind, called the other dwarves through the door. And put on a few eggs, there's a good fellow, Gandalf called after him, as the hobbits stumped off to the pantries. And just bring out the cold chicken and pickles. Seems to know much more about the insides of my larders than I do myself, thought Mr. Baggins, who was feeling positively flummoxed, and was beginning to wonder whether the most wretched adventure had not come right into his house. By the time he had got all the bottles and dishes and knives and forks and glasses and plates and spoons and things piled up on big trays, he was getting very hot and red in the face and very annoyed. Confiscate and be bother these dwarves, he said aloud. Why don't they come and lend a hand? Lo and behold, there stood Bolin and Wallen at the door of the kitchen, and Feely and Keely behind them, and before they could say knife, they had whisked away the trays and a couple of small tables into the parlour and set out everything afresh. Gandalf sat at the head of the party of the thirteen dwarves all round, and Bilbo sat on a stool at the fireside, nibbling at a biscuit. You see, his appetite was quite taken away by all of the ruckus. And trying to look as if this was all perfectly ordinary and not in the least an adventure. The dwarves ate and ate and talked and talked and time got on. At last they pushed their chairs back and Bilbo made a move to collect the plates and glasses. I suppose you will stay for supper, he said in his politest unpressing tones. Course, said Thorin. After that, we shan't get through with business till late, and we must have some music first. Now to clear up. Thereupon the twelve doors, not Thorin, he was too important and stayed talking to Gandalf, jumped to their feet and made tall piles of things. Off they went, not waiting for trays, balancing columns of plates, each with a bottle at the top with one hand, while the hobbit ran after them, almost squeaking with fright. Please be careful. And please don't trouble, I can manage. But the dwarves only started to sing. Chip the glasses, crack the plates, blunt the knives and bend the forks. That's what Bilbo Baggins hates. Smash the bottles and burn the corks. Cut the cloth and tread on the flat. Pour the milk on the pantry floor. Leave the bones on the bedroom mat. Splash wine on every door. Dump the crocks in boiling bowl. Pound them up with a thumping pole. And when you finish, if any are whole, Send them down the hall to roll. That's what Bilbo Baggins hates, So carefully, carefully with the plates. And of course they did none of these dreadful things, And everything was cleaned and put away safe and quick as lightning. While the hobbit was turning round and round in the middle of the kitchen, Trying to see what they were doing. Then they went back and found Thorin with his feet on the fender smoking a pipe. He was blowing the most enormous smoke rings, and wherever he told one to go it went, up the chimney or behind the clock, on the mantelpiece or under the table, all round and round the ceiling, 
but wherever it went, it was not quick enough to escape Gandalf. Pop! He sent a smaller smoke ring from his short clay pipe straight through each one of Thorin's. Then Gandalf's smoke ring would go green and come back to hover over the wizard's head. He had a cloud of them about him already, and in the dim light, it made him look strange and sorcerous. Bilbo stood still and watched. He loved smoke rings. And then he blushed to think how proud he had been yesterday morning of the smoke rings he had sent up on the wind over the hill. Now for some music, said Thorin. Bring out the instruments. Keely and Feely rushed to find their bags and brought back fiddles. Dori, Nori, and Ori brought out flutes from somewhere inside their coats. Bomber produced a drum from the hall. Beefer and Bofer went out too and came back with clarinets they had left among the walking sticks. Dwalin and Bolin said, Excuse me, I left mine in the porch. Just bring mine in with you, said Thorin. And they came back with violas as big as themselves and with Thorin's harp wrapped in green cloth. It was as beautiful a golden harp as any had ever seen, and when Thorin struck it, the music began all at once, so sudden and sweet that Bilbo forgot everything else, and he was swept away into the dark lands under strange moons, far over the water, and very far from his hobbit hole under the hill. The dark came into the room from the little window that opened in the side of the hill. The firelight flickered, it was April, and still they played on, or the shadows of Gandalf's beard wagged against the wall. The dark filled all the room, and the fire died down, and the shadows were lost, and still they played on, and suddenly the first one, and then another, and then another began to sing as they played, deep-throated singing of the dwarves in deep places of their ancient homes. And this is like a fragment of their soul, if it can be like their song without their music. Far over the misty mountains cold, to dungeons deep and caverns old, we must away ere break of day to seek the pale enchanted gold. The dwarves of yore made mighty spells while hammers fell like ringing bells. In places deep where dark things sleep, in hollow halls beneath the fells, for ancient kings and elvish lord, their many a gleaming golden hoard, they shaped and wrought, and light they caught, to hide in gems on health of sword. On silver necklaces they strung, the flower stars on crowns they hung. The dragon fire in twisted wire, they meshed the light of moon and sun. Far over the misty mountain cold, to dungeons deep and caverns old, we must away ere break of day to claim our long forgotten gold. Goblets they carved there for themselves, and harps of gold where no man delves. There they lay long, and many a song was sung and unheard by men or elves. The pines were roaring on the height, the winds were moaning in the night. The fire was red, it flaming spread. The trees like torches blazed with light. The bells were ringing in the dale. The men looked up with faces pale. The dragon's ire, more fierce than fire, laid low their towers and houses frail. The mountain smoked beneath the moon. The dwarves, they heard the tramp of doom. They fled their hall to dying fall beneath his feet beneath the moon, far over the misty mountains grim, to dungeons deep and caverns dim, we must away ere break of day, to win our harps and gold from him. As they sang, the hobbit felt the love of beautiful things made by hands and by cunning and by magic moving through him, a fierce and jealous love, the desire of the hearts of dwarves, then something tookish woke up inside of him, and he wished to go and see the great mountains, and hear the pine trees and the waterfalls, and explore the caves and were a stored instead of a walking stick. 
he looked out of the window. The stars were out in the dark sky above the trees. He thought of the jewels of the dwarves shining in the caverns. Suddenly, in the wood beyond the water, a flame leapt up, probably someone lighting wood fire. And he thought of plundering dragons settling on his quiet hill and kindling it all to flame. He shuddered, and very quickly he was playing Mr. Baggins of Bag End under hill again. He got up trembling. He had less than half a mind to fetch the lamp, and more than half a mind to pretend to, and go and hide behind the beer barrels in the cellar, and not come out again until all the dwarves had gone away. Suddenly he found that the music and the singing had stopped, and they were all looking at him with eyes shining in the dark. Where are you going to? said Thorin, in a tone that seemed to show that he had guessed both halves of the hobbit's mind. What about a little light? said Bilbo apologetically. We like the dark, said all the dwarves. Dark for dark business. There are many hours before dawn. Of course, said Bilbo, and he sat down in a hurry. He missed the stool and sat in the fender, knocking over the poker and the shovel with a crush. Hush, said Gandalf. Let Thorin speak. And this is how Thorin began. Gandalf, dwarves, and Mr. Baggins, we are met together in the house of our friend and fellow conspirator. This our most excellent and audacious hobbit. May the hair on his toes never fall out. All praise to his wine hail. He paused for breath and for a polite remark from the hobbit. But the compliments were lost on poor Bilbo Baggins, who was wagging his mouth in protest at being called audacious. And worst of all, a fellow conspirator, though no noise came out, he was so incredibly flummoxed. So Thorin went on. We are met here to discuss our plans, our ways, means, policy, and devices. We shall soon, before break of day, start on a long journey. A journey from which some of us, perhaps all of us, except our friend and counsellor, the ingenious wizard Gandalf, may never return. It is our solemn intent, our object, is, I take it, well known to us all. To the esteemable Mr. Baggins, and perhaps to one or two of the younger dwarves. I think it should be right to name Feely and Keeley here, for instance. The exact situation at the moment may require a little brief explanation. This was Thorin's style. He was an important dwarf. If he had been allowed, he would have probably gone on like this until he was out of breath, without telling anyone there anything that was not known already. But he was rudely interrupted. Bilbo couldn't bear it any longer. At May Never Return, he began to feel a shriek coming up inside, and very soon it burst out like the whistle of an engine coming out of a tunnel. All the dwarves sprang up, knocking over the table. Gandalf struck a blue light on the end of his magic staff, and in its firework glare the poor little hobbit could be seen kneeling on the hearth rug, shaking like a jelly that was melting. Then he fell flat on the floor and kept on calling out, Struck by lightning! Struck by lightning! over and over again. And that was all they could get out of him for a very long time. So they took him and laid him out of the way on a drawing-room sofa with a drink at his elbow. And they went back to their dark business. Excitable little fellow, said Gandalf. As they sat down again, Gets funny queer fits. But he is one of the best, one of the best as fierce as a dragon in a pinch. If you've ever seen a dragon in a pinch, you will realise that this was only poetical exaggeration applied to any hobbit. Even to old Took's great-great-granduncle Bullroar, who was so huge for a hobbit that he could ride a horse. He charged the ranks of goblins of the Mount Graham in the Battle of Green Fields, and knocked their king Goldfimble's head clean off with a wooden club. It sailed a hundred yards through the air and went down a rabbit hole, and in this way the battle was won and the game of golf was invented at the same time. In the meanwhile, however, Bull Roarer's gentler descendant was reviving in the drawing room. After a while, and a drink, he crept nervously to the door of the parlour. 
This is what he heard. Gloin speaking. Hum! <clears throat> or some sort of noise more or less like that. Will he do, you think? It's all very well for Gandalf to talk about the Hobbit being fierce, but one shriek like that in a moment of excitement would be enough to wake the dragon and all his relatives and kill the lot of us. I think it sounded more like a fright than excitement. In fact, if it had not been for the sign on the door, I should have been sure that I had come to the wrong house. As soon as I clapped eyes on the little fellow, bobbing and puffing on the mat, I had my doubts. He looks more like a grocer than a burglar. Then Mr. Baggins turned the handle and went in. The took side had won. He suddenly felt he would go without bed and breakfast to be thought more fierce. As for little fellow bobbing on the mat, it almost made him really fierce. Many times afterwards, the Baggins part regretted what he did now, and said to himself, Bilbo, you were a fool. You walked right in and put your foot in it. Pardon me, he said. If I have overheard words that you were saying, I don't pretend to understand what you are talking about, or your reference to burglars, but I think I am right in believing. This is what he called being on his dignity. That you think I am no good. I will show you. I have no signs on my door. It was painted a week ago. And I am quite sure you have come to the wrong house. As soon as I saw your funny faces on the doorstep, I had my doubts. But treat it as if it was the right one. Tell me what you want done, and I will try it. If I have to walk from here to the east of east and fight the wild wereworms of the last desert... You see, I had a great-great-great-great-granduncle once. Bull Roro took and... Yes, yes, but that was long ago, said Gloin. I was talking about you, and I assure you there is a mark on this door. The usual one in the trade, or it used to be. Burglar wants a good job, plenty of excitement and reasonable reward. That's how it's usually read. You can say expert treasure hunter instead of burglar if you like. Some of them do. It's all the same to us. Gandalf told us that there was a man of sorts in these parts looking for a job at once, and that he had arranged for a meeting here this Wednesday at tea time. Of course there is a mark, said Gandalf. I put it there myself. For good reason. You asked me to find you a fourteenth man for your expedition, and I chose Mr. Buggins. Just let anyone say I chose the wrong man or the wrong house, and you could stop at thirteen, and have all the bad luck you like, or go back to digging coal. He scowled so angrily at Gloin that the dwarf huddled back into his chair, and when Bilbo tried to open his mouth to ask a question, he turned and frowned at him, and stuck out his bushy eyebrows till Bilbo shut his mouth tight with a snap. That's right, said Gandalf. Let's have no more argument. I have chosen Mr. Baggins, and that ought to be enough for all of you. If I say he's a burglar, a burglar he is, or he will be when the time comes. There is a lot more to him than you guess, and a deal more than he has any idea himself. You may, possibly, all live to thank me. Now, Bilbo, my boy, fetch the lamp and let us have a little light on this. On the table, in the light of a big lamp with a red shade, he spread out a piece of parchment rather like a map. This was made by Thorum. Your grandfather thought him, he said in answer to the dwarves' excited questions. It is a plan of the mountain. I don't see that this will help much, said Thorin disappointedly after a glance. I remember the mountain well enough and the lands around it. And I know where Mirkwood is and where the withered heath is and where the great dragons bred. There is a dragon marked in red on the mountain, said Bolin, but it'll be easy enough to find him without that, if ever we were to arrive there. There is one point that you haven't noticed, said the wizard, and that is the secret entrance. You see that rune on the west side, and the hand pointed to it from the other runes? That marks a hidden passage to the lower halls. It may have been secret once, said Thorin, but how do we know that it's secret any longer? 
Old Smog has lived there long enough now to find out anything there is about those old caves, you know. He may, but he can't have used it for years and years. Why? Because it is too small. Five feet high, the door, and three may walk abreast, say the rules. But Smaug could not creep into a hole that size, not even when he was a young dragon. Certainly not after devouring so many dwarves and men of Dale. It seems like a great big hole to me, squeaked Bilbo, who had no experience of dragons, only of hobbit holes. He was getting excited and interested again, so that he forgot to keep his mouth shut. He loved maps, and in his hall there hung a large one of the country round, with all his favourite walks marked in red ink. How could such a large door have been kept secret from everybody outside, apart from the dragon? He asked. He was only a little hobbit, you must remember. In lots of ways, said Gandalf. But in the way that this one has been hidden, we don't know without going to see. From what it says on the map, I should guess that there is a closed door, which has been made to look exactly like the side of the mountain. That is the usual way for dwarven methods. I think that is right, isn't it? Quite right, said Thorin. Also, went on Gandalf, I forgot to mention that with the map went key, a small and curious key. Here it is, he said as he handed to Thorin a key with a long barrel and intricate wards made of silver. Keep it safe. Indeed I will, said Thorin, and he fastened it up on a fine chain that hung around his neck under his jacket. Now things begin to look more hopeful. This news alters them much for the better. So far we've had no clear idea what to do. We thought of going east, as quiet and careful as we could, as far as the Long Lake. After that, the trouble would begin. And if I know time before that... If you know anything about the roads east, interrupted Gandalf. We might go from there up to the river running went on Thorin without taking notice. And so to the ruins of Dale, the old town in the valley there under the shadow of the mountain. But we none of us like the idea of the front gate. The river runs right out and through it on the great cliff at the south of the mountain. And out of it comes the dragon too, far too often unless he's changed his habits. That would be no good, said the wizard. Not without a mighty warrior, even a hero. I tried to find one, but warriors are busy fighting one another in distant lands. And in this neighbourhood, heroes are scarce, and simply not to be found. Swords in these parts are mostly blunt, and axes are used for trees. Shields as cradles and dish covers, and dragons are comfortably far off, and therefore legendary. That is why I settled on burglary, especially when I remembered the existence of a side door. And here is our little Bilbo Baggins, the burglar, the chosen and selected burglar. So now let us get on and make some plans. Very well, then, said Thorin. Supposing the burglar expert gives us some ideas or suggestions? He turned with mock politeness to Bilbo. First I should like to know a bit more about things, said he, feeling all confused and a bit shaky inside, but so far still tookishly determined to go on with things. I mean about the gold and the dragon and all that, and how it got there and who it belongs to, and so on and further. Bless me, said Thorin. Haven't you got a map? And didn't you hear our song? And haven't we been talking on about this for hours? All the same, I should like to hear it plain and clear. He said obstinately, putting on his business manner usually reserved for people who tried to borrow money off of him, and doing his best to appear wise and prudent and professional and live up to Gandalf's recommendation. Also, I should like to know about risks, out-of-pocket expenses, time required, and remuneration and so forth. By which he meant, what am I going to get out of it, and am I going to come back alive? Oh, very well, said Thorin. Long ago in my grandfather Thorer's time, our family was driven out of the far north and came back with all their wealth and their tools to this mountain on the map. 
It had been discovered by my far ancestor, Thrain the Old. But now they mined, and they tunneled, and they made huger the holes and greater the workshops. And in addition, I believe they found a good deal of gold, and a great many jewels too. Anyway, they grew immensely rich and famous, and my grandfather was king under the mountain again and treated with such great reverence by mortal men who lived to the south, and were gradually spreading up the river running as far as the valley overshadowed by the mountain. They built the merry town of Dale there for those days. Kings used to send for our smiths, and reward even our least skilled most richly. Fathers would beg us to take their sons as apprentices, and pay us handsomely especially in food supplies, which we never bothered to grow or find for ourselves. Altogether, those were good days for us, and the poorest of us had money to spend and to lend, and leisure to make beautiful things just for the fun of it, not to speak of the most marvellous and magical toys, the like of which has not been found in the world nowadays. So my grandfather's hall became full of armour and jewels and carvings and cups, and the toy market of Dale was the wonder of the north. Undoubtedly, that was what brought the dragon. Dragons steal gold and jewels, you know, from men and elves and dwarves, wherever they can find them, and they guard their plunder as long as they live, which is practically forever, unless they're killed. And never a brass ring of it enjoyed, Indeed, they hardly know a good bit of work from bad, though they are usually have a pretty good notion of current market value. They can't make a thing for themselves, not even mend a little loose scale of their armour. There were lots of dragons in the north in those days, and gold was probably getting scarce up there, with the dwarves flying south or getting killed, and all the general waste and destruction the dragons make going from bad to worse. There was also the most specially greedy, strong and wicked worm, called Smaug. One day he flew up into the air and came south. The first we heard of it was a noise like a hurricane coming from the north, and the pine trees on the mountains creaking and cracking in the wind. Some of the dwarves who happened to be outside, I was a lucky one, a fine adventurous lad in those days, always wandering about, and it saved my life that day. Well, from a good way off, we saw the dragon settle on our mountain in a spout of flame and smoke. And then he came down the slopes. And when he reached the woods, they were all up in fire. By that time, all the bells were ringing in Dale, and the warriors were arming. The dwarves rushed out of their great gate. But there was the dragon waiting for them. None escaped that way. The river rushed up in steam and fog fell on Dale, and in the fog the dragon came on them and destroyed most of the warriors. The usual unhappy story. It was only too common in those days. Then he went back and crept in through the front gate and routed out all of the halls and lanes and tunnels, alleys and cellars and mansions and passageways. After that, there were no dwarves left alive inside, and he took all their wealth for himself. Probably for that dragon's ways, he has it all piled up in a great heap far inside, and he sleeps on it for a bed. Later, he used to crawl out of the great gate and come by night to Dale and carry away people, especially maidens, to eat until Dale was ruined and the people were all dead or gone. What goes on there now, I don't know for certain. I don't suppose anyone lives nearer to the mountain than the far edge of the long lake nowadays. The few of us that were well outside sat and wept in hiding, and cursed Smaug. And there we were unexpectedly joined by my father and my grandfather with singed beards. They looked very grim, but they said very little. When I asked how they got away, they told me to hold my tongue and said that one day in proper time I should know. After that, he went away. 
and we have had to earn our living as best we could, up and down the land, often sinking as low as blacksmith work or even coal mining. But we have never forgotten our stolen treasure, and even now, when I will allow, we have a good bit laid by and are not so badly off. Here Thorin stroked the gold chain around his neck. We still mean to get it back and bring our curses home to Smaug, if we can. I have often wondered about my father and grandfather's escape. I see now they must have had a private side door, which only they knew about. But apparently they made a map, and I should like to know how Gandalf got hold of it. And why did it not come down to me, their rightful heir? I did not get hold of it. I was given it, said the wizard. Your grandfather, Thoror, was killed, you remember, in the mines of Moria by Azog the Goblin. Curse his name, yes, said Thorin. And Thrain, your father, went away on the 21st of April, a hundred years ago last Thursday, and has never been seen by you since. True, true, said Thorin. Well, your father gave me this to give to you. And if I have chosen my own time and way for handing it over, you can hardly blame me. Considering the trouble I had finding you, your father could not remember his own name when he gave me the paper, and never told me yours. So on the whole, I think I ought to be praised and thanked. Here it is, said he, handing the map to Thorin. I don't understand, said Thorin, and Bilbo felt he would have liked to say the same. The explanation did not seem to explain. Your grandfather, said the wizard, slowly and grimly, gave them up to his son for safety before he went to the mines of Moria. Your father went away to try his luck with the map after your grandfather was killed, and lots of adventures of the most unpleasant sort he had. But he never got near the mountain. How he got there I don't know but I found him a prisoner in the dungeons of the necromancer. Whatever were you doing there? asked Thorin with a shudder, and all the doors shivered. Never you mind. I was finding out things as usual, and a nasty dangerous business it was. Even I, Gandalf, only just escaped. I tried to save your father, but it was too late. He was witless and wandering, and had forgotten almost everything except the map and the key. We have long ago paid the goblins of Moria, said Thorin. We must give a thought to the necromancer. Don't be absurd. He is an enemy of far beyond your power, of all the dwarves put together, really. If you could all be collected again from the four corners of the earth, the one thing your father wished for his son was to read them up and use the key. The dragon and the mountain are more than big enough tusks for you. Hear, hear! said Bilbo, and accidentally he had said it out loud. Hear what? They all said, turning towards him suddenly, and he was so flustered that he answered. Hear what I've got to say. Well, what's that then? they asked. Well, I should say that you ought to go east and have a look around. After all, there is the side door, and dragons must sleep sometimes, I suppose. And if you sit on the doorstep long enough, I dare say you will think of something. And, well, don't you know, I think we have talked long enough for one night. If you see what I mean, what about bed and an early start and all that? I will give you a good breakfast before you go. Before we go, I suppose you mean, said Thorin. Aren't you the burglar? And isn't sitting on the doorstep your job? Not to speak of getting inside the door. But I agree about bed and breakfast. I like six eggs with ham. When starting a journey, fried, not poached. And mind that you don't break them. After all, the others had ordered their breakfasts without so much as a please, which annoyed Bilbo very much. They all got up. The hobbit had to find room for each and every one of them. And he filled up all of his spare rooms and made beds on chairs and sofas before he got them all stowed and he went to his own little bed, very tired and not altogether happy. One thing he did make up his mind about 
which do not bother to get up very early and cook everybody else's wretched breakfast. The tookishness was wearing off, and he was not quite so sure that he was going on any journey in the morning. As he lay there in bed, he could hear Thorin still humming to himself in the best bedroom next to him. Far over the misty mountains cold To dungeons deep and caverns old We must await ere break of day to find our long forgotten goal. Bilbo went to sleep with that in his ears, and it gave him very uncomfortable dreams. It was long after daybreak when he finally woke up.